that song that uh, made famous for somebody. <laughs> he starts off by saying, it's me again, Margaret. <laughs> yeah. Well, the song we just sung has a lot more meaning to me nowadays than it did years ago. I can remember sitting in the old Blessed City Church of Christ building at the funeral of one of my great-grandparents, and I don't know which one it was. But we're talking about 1965. And Daddy and all of us, as we were sitting with the family, and as was the custom, it still is a lot of places today, you had groups singing at a funeral in particular. And they were singing that song. And those making up the group singing were about as old as my great-grandparents. And Daddy observed after it was all over with, he said, I thought that was so moving. Look back there and see all those folks in their 70s and 80s singing where we'll never grow old. We don't live for this life. And nothing about being a Christian pertains ultimately and finally. That is, it doesn't terminate here. I've heard it said, and all too often it's true, when we study Jesus Christ, we study so much as if he began at his birth. But that was only one part of his existence. He's eternal and he existed in eternity. As John said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was light and the light was the light of man. The light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. And then verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But sometimes we forget that when he died, he didn't see see the did. He rose to the dead the third day and now sits right now at the right hand of God ruling making intercession for us, for he ever liveth so to do. And he's the only mediator between God and man. He's the good shepherd. He's the great physician. He offers hope when nobody else offers it. And in due process of time, while he was upon this earth, coming to do what only he could do, we find inspired Matthew, who was with him at the time, as one of the apostles, the record of which is found in Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13 and going through verse 19, Matthew 16, 13 through 19. He was journeying, and of course they walked, somewhat of a secluded place. They would sit down and rest so often. Why in the divine mind tabernacled in the flesh did he choose at this time to reveal what the world didn't understand and still largely does not? And some of my brethren don't really grasp the significance of what was done here in that long ago day. But the scripture reads, when Jesus came into coasts, meaning borders, a Caesarea Philippi. He asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He responded by saying, but 
who do you say I am? Now the focus has got from the Lord, their master, directly to them and their innermost being concerning the question. Every impetuous Peter pops up and says a marvelous thing. The good confession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responded and said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. In the gates of hell, more properly Hades, where the Spirit goes when it dies, awaiting the end of time and judgment. The gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Our Lord continued, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, it's quite easy to read that, and many of you have read it more times than you could ever begin to remember, and that's including me. But do you realize the world really doesn't understand that passage at all? But sadly, the people who say this Bible is the Word of God, and that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and the only Savior, they don't own what it says either. Let's look at it a moment. First of all, it's Jesus with his disciples in a certain area called Caesarea Philippi. And as he did so many times, it ought to be a cue to us to arouse people's interest if there is the ability of them to be aroused such things. Saying, who, who do you say, or who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? This is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Remember John 1? what we just said a while ago. This is that word tabernacling in the flesh, the second person of the Godhead. Well, when you have people circulating around among other people, they're going to hear things, and Jesus he says, tell me what people are saying about me. What do they think about me? And you get a picture in verse 14. They get rather specific. John the Baptist or Elias. Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And that reminds us of John 3.3 3, when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and made the statement to him, that we know that thou art a prophet come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Well, they recognize the divine Involvement, though they didn't understand. Then he pins them down, and Peter answers for all of them what was the truth. Well, you're the Christ. Now, that may not mean much to us today. It may mean just like somebody saying, you're whoever you are. Christ means anointing. Oh, what that conjured up in the mind of a Jew relative to the Messiah in the kingdom. You're the one. There is no other. Thou art the Christ. And he emphasizes it. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Do you realize how many people in this world don't believe that? I mentioned this before in sermons. It goes way back to when we had the lectureship on Muslims or Islam. And we had a man come to see what's going on, and he was a Muslim. And he was trying to be very ecumenical. He stood right outside the door there. I can look right now through the door window and see where we stood. And he was trying to say, you know, we're all one, worshiping one God. I said, I'll, I'll ask you one question. Is Jesus Christ of Nazareth the only begotten Son of God? And he did not bat an eye like some of my brethren might or something like that. He said, no. 
Every Jew on this earth, every Muslim on this earth, every person who's a Hindu or a Buddhist, they declare Jesus Christ of Nazareth is not the only begotten Son of God. And that covers a whole lot of land. Then when you add on the secularist, humanist, and atheist of every description, look what goes as far as people that don't believe that. Jesus said to the Jews in John 8, 24, for he was very straightforward, something a lot of people don't like. But truth's like that. Except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, did he mean what he said, and did he say what he meant? And what does that say about all these people I just mentioned? If you'll notice throughout the New Testament, much is said about the one God and the one Son of God. And Jesus pronounced the blessing upon Simon. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. But of course, Jesus fulfilling all the prophecies, working the miracles that proved he was from heaven, all of that was adequate evidence that he was who he claimed to be. Then as you come down, you see Peter talk about again or brought into the matter because Peter coming from the Greek word Petros had made this confession and Petros means a pebble or a stone and yet Jesus said upon this rock I will build my church and the Catholics turn cartwheels because they think he said I'll build my church on the pebble and that never has been very impressive to me. Maybe to you. But that does not sound like a very solid foundation. But when he says upon this rock, I'll build my church. He didn't use the same word. He used Petra. And you can hear the difference. Petros, Peter, Pebble. Petra is a large bedrock foundation stone. That's what he built the church on, or as he says here at this time in his earthly ministry, I will build my church. So the church is not built upon Peter or any other man, a group of men, or angels. But what is it built upon? A solid, proper foundation. What is that? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And disciples by the droves, once they became members of the church later on in the first century and later, died horrible deaths rather than deny that statement. And he said, I will build my church. That's future tense. Now, there are those who teach, or they still do. You don't hear much about it now. That the church is already in existence. They even have it going back to the days of Abraham, or they have it established in the days of John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist has been dead for a while here. Jesus said, I will build future tents yet out there in my future. I'll build my church. And when he says, and the gates of hell, which I said, is Hades, the place where the dead go and where Jesus went when he died on the cross, awaiting the resurrection. What he's saying, brethren, is they can kill me and I still will keep my promise. You can't stop God from keeping his promises. Why then will we trust in mere men but not trust in God? And those of us who know the Bible and know it's the revealed mind of God, and we read the account of the resurrection, we understand. But they didn't understand all these things at this time. And people today don't either. I, Jesus Christ, will build 
Future tense. My, it doesn't belong to anybody but me. Church. Singular. C-H-U-R-C-H. Now, I mentioned all these other religions and atheism and things like that earlier and how all those people are just as lost and headed for hell as they can be. But one of the most horrendous and infamous tools the devil has ever exercised and used to destroy people this remains to this day, and I have no doubt will continue to remain, denominationalism. People, even in the church, think of the Lord's church, the one he said he would build, as a denomination. Well, I want to pause here and interject this. If I'm teaching somebody or you're teaching somebody and they won't study their Bibles and you can't get them to study that Bible and the reason why is they're not that interested. You may be a good friend so they tolerate you until you get out of sight and then go do what they're really interested in, whatever that may be. But you're not going to do any good with anybody as far as that soul being saved if they're not interested enough in the Bible study. All around us, up and down this road, building after building, people are assembling for religious services. And they don't understand this passage any more than a June bug knows how to fly to the moon. They probably don't know what a June bug is. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. In the gates of Hades they can kill me, and it won't stop me from fulfilling this promise. All you've got to do is turn, read, understand the words, take the time. If you're only here for a short time, get ready for the day you leave. And you get to Acts chapter 2. One of the most beautiful chapters in the Bible. It's been called the hub of the Bible. Because everything before speaking of the church speaks of the church's future tense. Everything after Acts 2 speaks of the church existing. And it's in Acts 2 where you find that our Lord and Savior fulfilled His promise. And I know that He did because He added such as were being saved to the church. Singular. You can't find denominationalism in the Bible. Protestant denominationalism has been around since 1500s, so. Before that, predominantly among those believing in Christ was Roman Catholicism and the Eastern Orthodox Church and other such things. Prior to that, it was 300 years of people leaving the New Testament. Formed out of that apostasy of people having left the New Testament was Roman Catholicism. But we're more experienced, and probably most of us, some of us are, with Protestant denominations. They wouldn't have it any idea what you were talking about in the day that Jesus heard this. Oh, it's true, they didn't understand a lot of things about the true church because that's yet to come. But what a declaration this was to Jesus. I will build my church. They can kill me. It will stop me from building my church. And we understand why. Well, if you look at verse 19, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, don't you know, if you studied your Bible, that John chapters 14, 15, and 16, Jesus says that, not just of Peter, but every one of the apostles. It was Peter's sermon recorded in Acts 2, but he's standing up with the 11, and they're speaking. And they're gathered by the Holy Spirit. So I know they're all speaking the same thing. They're speaking the wonderful works of God. Directed by the Holy Spirit. And Peter's sermons recorded. And lo and behold, that audience there were people who had participated in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He said, you crucified and slain the Son of God. Now, 53 days before... 
And that city was in an uproar because the chief priest and all had worked it all out to kill Jesus. That's just 53 days before. And here stands all this going on right there. Well, there's honest souls in places you don't think they will be, folks. And on that day, the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, there were men who listened. They're called devout men. And they're devout religious people. And they worship the one God. And they're there doing what they think God requires of them. And lo and behold, they're not. That dispensation has passed away. It was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. That is the law of Moses, whereby all Jews... For 1,500 years, approach God in worship. I won't do anymore. Insufficient. Fulfilled its purpose. Won't work anymore. The sermon's interrupted. Hearts have been pricked by the truth. Guilty consciences move. And they cry out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And every denominational preacher I ever knew of said nothing. Here's what they will say. Invite Jesus into your heart. Believe only. Jesus will save you. You'll be born anew. They say it every day. That's all there is to it. Then go pick a, as they usually say, quote, a good sound Bible believing church, unquote. They don't even know what a good sound Bible believing church is because they don't even understand the church. They don't know what this is. They're sitting there shaking that Bible there. And how many Bibles in the United States? But those people were told as believers. What? I thought all you had to do was believe, and that was the end of it. As believers persuaded by the truth, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And there was something for them to do. And Peter, directed by the Holy Spirit, said, Repent as believers and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises unto you and to your children, all them that be afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And then we learn that the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. Verse 47. Listen, you can't join the church that Jesus promised to build here. It's an impossibility. Joining means there's an active effort on my part to choose to become. Being added is a passive thing. Now, who does the adding? Who knows the heart of the person that is... Believe, repenting, confess faith in Christ and being baptized. Who knows it thoroughly? Who knows the right motives of that person? Jesus Christ. Who is he? The only begotten Son of God. There's not another. Except you believe that he is the Son of God, you'll die in your sins. As he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. And he said to his apostles, if you love me, he will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. They understood that. And as believers, they repented and were baptized. The same day they were adding to them about 3,000 souls. Who did the adding? Jesus. They had to submit to him. How do you submit to Jesus? Doing what he tells you to do. And the way he told you to do it. For the reason he tells you to do it. You say, well, I think there's another way. Tell me. If you're in a position of authority, people show their submission to the authority you have by what? Well, don't go by the examples of this nation. But there the church began. Any church that did not begin there is not the church Jesus promised to build. Acts 20 and verse 28, going back to the promise Jesus made that I will build my church tells us that on that cross of Calvary, Jesus shed his blood to purchase the church. To God, how important 
is the church. Well, I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about the church Jesus built. That it was so important to him that he died for it. And that the purchase price is the blood of Christ. Ah, this church is not my church. It's not your church. It's the Lord's church. Give that terminology back to the domination. Start speaking as the oracles of God. We can easily adopt the jargon of the people around us. And they're the people who know the less about the church. As the Bible still says, speak those things that become sound doctrine. Or if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Call Bible things by Bible names. Do Bible things in Bible ways. What does that mean? Do what Jesus told you to do. Learn how New Testament uh, authority guides you. And so here they are in the church, Acts chapter 2. Very church Jesus promised to build. Now he says later on, much about the church. Now when I say he says, I mean Christ by the Holy Spirit through the inspired penman. Consider what Paul said to the church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. And he is the head of the body of the church. Who is the Pope? And no, will there be any such thing as a Pope? Because there wasn't any. The only way you can say that, that the Catholic Church exists is this. There was one church. Catholic means universal. And the Lord's Church is universal. And there's a heap of Catholics who don't even know the word Catholic. means universal. Roman Catholic clergy know. <laughs> Their doctrine knows because they're telling you they're it and there's no, nothing else. They understand that. If you ever convert a person to the truth of the New Testament, to become a New Testament Christian who's out of the Catholic Church, and they understand the one church concept, you won't have any problem with that when it comes. You just got to show them the right church. And you look at Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. Literally in the Greek it means since he's head of all things anyway, then he naturally would give him to be head of the church. Who would you expect to be head of the church? Verse 24, for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, we've studied already what one must do to become a Christian because becoming a Christian is the same thing being saved from your sins. Now, where did Christ put those on the day of Pentecost who were saved from their sin by him when they will to submit to the will of Jesus Christ. Where do you put them? In his church. And he didn't make any mistakes. He did not go say, join the church of your choice. He didn't say anything like that. You say, how do we have this church today? You have a Bible, don't you? Now, if it's proven to be the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God to man, you can learn from that Bible, can't you? Another reason we have it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. I decided to go back over these things because really a couple of weeks ago I received an email wanting to know about what contending for the faith, the paper, what church it was connected to. And I haven't felt very well, as you know. So I just, I've had several people, I've had to write and say, I just don't feel like engaging in written discussions now. And I mean people asking very good, honest questions. I'm just not able to mentally function to do that because I just can't, I'm sick. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. So I said, I think the simplest way for me to answer your question, and I directed them to the Spring Church of Christ Facebook page and the Spring Church of Christ uh, internet page. Very nice, short, brief letter. Didn't say who she was. Name indicated a, a feminine person. She wrote me back after I apologized for being so long and 
answering her. But the question she asked was, concerning contending for the faith, is it Baptist? Is it Methodist? Is it connected with the Church of Christ? I had no reason to believe, and I still believe, from what little I've read. She's an honest person and wanting to know. But I wanted to teach something. See, they can't think out of the denominational box. You may have it happen to you, as I read of it happening to Brother Woods one time, the late Brother Guy Woods. person says, of what church are you a member? And he decided that he would just give scriptural answers, but it certainly would confuse the denominational mind who can't think out of that box, or very rarely does. He said, I remember the church you read about the New Testament. Well, which one is that? It's the one to... Jesus purchased with his own blood. And you could see the man getting a little more perplexed every time. You say, well, which, which church is that one? He says, it's the one that Jesus shed his blood purchase. And he said, well, just tell me what name is above the building. He said, well, he didn't do so. He said, I could have, because the man was in a state of perplexion by that time. And so I could have said, though, that it's the building that bears the name of the one that shed his blood to purchase the church. You see, they can't think out of that human church that, that, that you know, here's, here's one church, but every page represents some different kind of church. But if you would just go to the Bible, the New Testament in particular, and just read and understand the words, how long did it take you to figure out what Jesus said in Matthew 16? And how long does it take a person to figure out in Acts 2 that the Lord started his church there and he added the people to it who had believed in him, repented of their sins, and were baptized for the remission of sins? And then these other passages. You know where the problem is? They're just not that interested. They're just not that interested. I've got another sermon I'm going to preach another time that I thought of that goes with this to those who are conversant with New Testament parlance on matters of this nature and certainly understand the Bible rightly divided concerning the church salvation. It'll not be new to you. But it has to do with one signal prerequisite for being able to go to heaven. The love of the truth. And if a person doesn't love the truth of God well enough to spend what years they have on this earth studying the Bible, and as we sing this silly jingle this time of year, he's making a list and checking it twice. Well, you better check your list concerning what God requires of you as we studied a week ago to see if you've, <laughs> that you've got your list right as to what God requires of you. Now, some people are going to tell you he doesn't require much of anything. You already know better than that. If I let Christ have his way with me as we sing in the song, it'll be by submitting to his will. And if somebody tells me there's another way to let Christ have his way with me, I would like to know how that can be. So, the writer of Hebrews says, he's the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 9. The church, the one body of Christ, all the saved are in it. No person who is accountable to God for his or her actions is saved and outside of it. And the Lord knows those who belong to him. And on the day of judgment, he won't forget you. But he'll acknowledge you personally before the Father. And you won't have to worry about whether there be enough time because time is no more. Just Can you imagine standing before the Christ 
and him acknowledging you personally. Out of all the billions of people who lived, that you loved him and kept his word and studied and learned about the truth and everybody else doing all sorts of other things that usually fit to this world. Let us think along these lines regarding the most important thing we got about us, and that's our soul, that it will be saved and how Christ saves it through the gospel, his power to save, Romans 1, 16. If you need to obey the gospel or if you need to repent of sins as an erring child of God and ask for forgiveness, we'll pray with you and for you. Now we offer this time for you to come if you need while we stand and sing.